thanks so much for joining Making Healthcare Work for You, Different Perspectives and Empowering Solutions. I'm Stephanie Fields, joined by my co-host, Dr. Apoorv Gupta, and today we are welcomed by Dr. Mark Schiffman, who is the co-founder of Voice Love, and he is also an executive co-director of the Fibroid Center at Weill Cornell Medicine Center, but it's a longer title, so I would like you to say that because you say it, it better <laughs> and clearly with the words. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's the Wild Cornell Medicine Fibroid and Adenomyosis Center. Mark, the coolest thing that you've done in relation to this and really your contribution to the pandemic, which is remarkable, is co-creating Voice Love, which is essentially a cell phone that operates as a walkie-talkie and allows patients to have a secure communication method with their family near and far. So why don't you tell us a little bit how you founded this company or co-founded this company and the difference that it's making? Sure. So uh, it started early in the pandemic when they needed volunteers to work in the ICU after several of the doctors were ill. So my colleague, Dr. Tamitha Fenster, um, went to volunteer in the ICU. She asked me if I wanted to join. So I said, of course. And we were trying to be ICU doctors. And the day that we were going to start, doctors from around the country came to New York to help out because New York was the first place having a surge. So they didn't need us to be ICU doctors anymore, which was probably a, a good thing. Um, we studied as much as we can, but, you know, Dr. Gupta spent years, <laughs> you know, learning and studying um, ICU medicine. So we said, well, we're here to help. What can we help you with? And they said, we're really struggling contacting all of these families. These patients are so sick, require so much care. It could be two hours after our shift is done at 11 o'clock at night, and we still haven't been able to call anyone. So we started a program where we got several other doctors from Wild Cornell Medicine to round in the morning with us. And after rounds, we would break away and call the families so they could know and expect every day. Uh, a regular phone call with an update. And really, even if there was not much going on, even the slightest little change, it's so meaningful for the families to just hear anything. So we started on a Saturday morning. And after rounds, we all got together and every single family member were, were desperate and they all wanted the same thing. Can you hold the phone up so they could hear our voice? So we were kind of heartbroken. Um, Tamith and I put our heads together and we found at Target a kid's toy, which was a speaker that connected to an app. So I went and purchased a couple. And the next day after rounds, we gave it out to families. And for those families, it was transformative all day long. I love you. We miss you. We're fighting with you. Multiple different languages playing right to the bedside. Um, so by that Sunday afternoon, I had reached out to the toy company. They agreed to donate for all of New York Presbyterian's ventilator patients. And we started a program to, to give these out, uh, that got some TV coverage and throughout the rest of the year, families from around the country would write to us and we would purchase these toys and ship them out to the hospitals. Um, unfortunately on December 25th, my mother developed a fever and she wound up being admitted to the ICU and passing after a long ICU stay. And Tamith and I were just, she was heartbroken. You know, we're very close for me. Um, and for all, what, everything we had just witnessed. And we said, we need to transform all of hospital communication. This is just, it's not acceptable. So we met with the American Hospital Association several times and their cybersecurity experts. We spoke to nurses, techs, patients, families, doctors, anyone that could give us input. And then we went ward to ward, seeing what patients were not being served by the current methods. And then we sat down to create a solution. Yeah, and, and Mark, actually, you know, that's a great point, to, you know, for me to just, I guess, be the segue, you know, tell us a little bit about that solution, please. Uh, because, I mean, obviously, you described the situation in a very compelling way. And I think we've all experienced it, but particularly through COVID, you know, the, the cutoff uh, in terms of communication was so intense. Uh, but in general, I guess, I think that's what the, the point you're making is that uh, the, the, the uh, disconnect from information is pretty stark uh, for, for the patient as well as for the family members. So please tell us a little bit of what is the solution that you've come up with? Sure. 
So as we walked around the hospital, we would encounter sight impaired or blind patients, and they had no solution that they could use independently. Uh, we encountered elderly patients or patients that were just so sick and just felt ill that they can't sit there talking on a phone or using it. And they couldn't even open an app or, you know, all these type of things that we just take for granted as just being simple, fast, oh, oh get a WhatsApp page or something like that. Um, we saw in the neonatal ICUs, you know, the mothers and fathers and family being separated, all of the, the different challenges. So we, we knew that we needed to create a way that virtually people could have whoever would give them the love and support that they need when they're sick could be right to the bedside. So we wound up developing a fairly sophisticated walkie-talkie system. So our app turns phones into HIPAA compliant walkie talkies and they have secure channels. You could create a channel for your healthcare proxy, create a channel for your family, channel for your friend, channel for your church, whatever it is that is meaningful to your experience and helping you when you need it. That's what we developed. So it can be a two way system. I know in the ICU, Dr. Eli, after they saw um, they rounded on a patient. They would just update all the family and answer questions back and forth very efficiently, right from the bed, and then go on to the next patient. Or it could be only one way, meaning if a patient's very ill or if they're on a ventilator or in a coma, we need the sound to be able to, to play automatically. So we developed features where that can happen. You told us in the pre-interview that delirium is a tremendous issue. And one of the things that makes the biggest difference is the family engagement. And so what have you seen? Was there an immediate impact whenever you were first working in there and you didn't have any of these ways to communicate? And then all of a sudden these people have this channel to communicate. Did you see the patient's you know, having a better response, being more aware or hanging on longer? I don't know. What did, what did that look like? Well, so there were several patients that woke up or came off the ventilator that recalled hearing their family messages. And one very inspiring interview I heard was a patient from Vanderbilt who said that hearing the messages from his four-year-old granddaughter gave him the will to fight and helped him focus. And that was so powerful um, to me when we heard that. And we realized just how powerful voice is as a medium and family members didn't want video nurses did not want to be filmed you know we really created a solution that took into account all the different um, people using it and what their needs are and also we had to develop it to make sure we didn't take or need any phi we want something to very easily integrate to healthcare. you know so we're agnostic of any medical record system we don't need to integrate there when a patient and their family are exchanging personal information, there's no reason for a hospital to be privy to that. Mark, it's a really compelling solution that you've designed. And obviously, as, as we hear in general, when we hear about new solutions, our minds are racing in many different directions, trying to figure out what is this, you know, we haven't really touched it and felt it at this point. But maybe you can describe a little bit of how exactly is it activated? How does uh, someone find out that you know their their paid their loved one is in a hospital. Oftentimes, you don't even know uh, when a channel gets created. Then does someone need to coordinate? Uh, you know the person on the other end of the channel. Uh, when should they be communicating? When should they not be communicating? There's so many you know things like that that need to be coordinated when it comes to communication. Please help us think through some of those. Sure. So one of the things when we were developing this and we met with several app development firms software companies and we settled on working with a firm who is out of buffalo named helm and they're excellent at user experience you know and, and that's such an important thing because you could have a great technology but if it's onerous to implement or use then you're really not helping people so we've created a system whereby as a patient arrives to the hospital, you know, if a patient's young and healthy and can use their phone, then they can be connected, you know, on their own methods. You know, we're really focusing on the populations and there are many that, 
you know, are not able to easily um, connect. So as the social worker does their initial phone call to the healthcare proxy, um, they've been telling them about the app and just they download the app and the hospital gives them a channel. Once the healthcare proxy has a channel, they just text invite whoever they want to invite into that channel. And it's got 10 digits of security. Um, so it's kind of an impenetrable channel. And then they could use it however they see fit. If they want to, for kids, we could get all their classmates into a channel. If we want to invite athletes or celebrities to send messages to kids. You know, we've been able to, to do that to really brighten their day. Um, for mothers with a premium in the NICU, you know, it helps with postpartum depression scores, which is this, a major problem um, for those mothers if they're able to read to their infants and pray and sing. Um, for some patients, you know, end of life things come up unpredictably sometimes. And you have a very short period of time to get end of life prayers or things like that. Um, or remotely, if something happens when you're out of the country or somewhere else to be able to connect to the bedside immediately. So we're running everything through the social workers who love it because it's really meaningful for them to be able to easily connect. And for the doctors and nurses, they can easily connect to family at the touch of a button. And really, that's how it is. We created software, which is very easy to use. The hospital can assign a code with a click and then also delete the code with a click. And so going back to delirium, because that is one, you said family engagement is one of the best ways to help with that. So why is that such a big issue and how does this help? Sure. So I was actually kind of late to the game in, in learning a lot about delirium. It's something that most of my surgeries are outpatient procedures. Most of my patients are um, younger women who are having um, difficulty with their periods or issues with infertility. So it's usually an outpatient type of thing. And it's much less common for me to be um, going to the ICUs and, and, you know, following my patients there. It was when my mother who had no medical problems, not on any medicines, completely healthy. Any time that I wasn't there, the nurses were contacting me that she was getting very agitated, very confused, and um, they wanted to sedate her and, and things like that. Um, so that was kind of my first introduction to delirium. And what I learned is actually delirium is a huge problem in the healthcare system. So there's been publications extensively in orthopedics, geriatrics, cardiology, um, pulmonology, you name it. That field has published about delirium. 20% of pediatric ICU kids develop delirium. And the costs to the hospital system are really anywhere between 60 and $150 billion a year. So it's probably the biggest financial loss to the U.S. healthcare system. Um, what we really did is we synthesized across all of these different fields and realized the extent of the problem. So as far as the only thing that's been shown to be helpful for delirium is family engagement. So familiar family interaction, the more the better. And there's something called the ABCDEF bundle of care in medicine. The D stands for delirium, the F stands for family engagement. And if you're able to employ the A through F bundle, it's been shown that you should have the best outcomes for patients with the lowest cost of care. Delirium develops in over 75% of ICU patients. And what it leads to are much longer hospitalizations, more complications, a lot of cognitive decline, um, and actually much more mortality in the hospital. So I think we're really the you know, early group to recognize what a problem it is and also the best way to, to go about trying to engage. Yeah, Mark, you had mentioned that you have now, uh, uh, now the recipient of an NIH uh, grant to study this uh, with at Vanderbilt. And so please, uh, maybe you can talk to us about what is it exactly you're planning to do there? Sure. So when I started learning a lot about delirium 
and started reading all the research and the papers, you know, and this is something that there's hundreds of articles, New England Journal, JAMA. Um, one of the authors on many of those papers was a doctor at Vanderbilt known as Dr. Wes Eli. So I reached out to him and it's been his life's work in trying to combat delirium and trying to improve family engagement. So I told him about it. He tried it out and he actually described it as a trivial pursuit moment. So he said in the 80s or whenever it was when him and his friends would get together and they would play trivial pursuit. Like the first time they played it, they're like, why has this not been thought of before? So, you know, he has a lot of funny expressions and things like that. But he was like, this needs to be everywhere. This is how we can keep um, patients and family engaged. This is how we can, you know, work to implement our bundles that we know are going to help patients, families, and hospitals. What do you think is it that voice is actually communicating? Is it ultimately compassion? Is it love? Uh, what is it that you you think that the family engagement is try, is actually modulating through voice? Uh, and how is it making a difference? I'd love to have your thoughts on that, please. So I, I think that there is actually many levels of ways that it's beneficial. Um, you know, if I take, we're applying with Vanderbilt for the neonatal ICU, there are benefits to the mothers from the mother's voice. And there's also benefits to the developing infant, lower pain scores during procedures, better milk production. These are all things that really we need to, to study more. Um, patients that woke up from the ventilators, they remembered hearing family messages and said that it helped them. So that's obviously to the patient, but then also speaking from experience, the family that's remote and not there at the bedside um, fortunately for my father and my sister, they were able to send messages, you know, and feel connected, but we know that around the country and world that that was not the case. And that creates a lot of trauma to the, the families. Some families, it was very meaningful to them to play the patient's favorite song as they withdrew care and said that that'll, for the rest of their lives, that'll bring them comfort. So I think that there are many different layers that that can be helped and really just everyone being connected and help each other should really be our collective goals my final question is a little bit of a warm and fuzzy one related to this what do you hope your legacy is with voice love what do you hope the the broad impact is once this has really infiltrated the medical system so we are building this in my mother's honor so for every child that has all his classmates in a channel and celebrities send them messages every day and they get a smile every day or something to look forward to for every um elderly patient that just feels love and support coming to them whether it be from all their you know church members or or anything you know a patient from africa getting messages from her her village played right to the bedside all day long you know, it's it's such a meaningful thing that I think voice love really is going to change the world. And I, I know that sounds like such a, a wild claim, but it's it's really not. It's just a different way of thinking. You know, as long as we could create a secure thing that doesn't need any PHI, hospitals, they really should embrace this because it's also going to save them millions of dollars. And that's part of what our grant of our $3 million grant is going to show the cost savings um, to the biggest loss in all of healthcare. Now finally have a tool to help reduce that. So you can do the right thing for people and also save a lot of money at the same time. So I think that's kind of a, you know, we're going to improve the healthcare system in my mother's honor and help people around the world. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing all about voice love. It sounds like it's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for sharing your story about your mother. Really feel for you, you know, having lost a loved one recently too. Can only imagine what you're going through. It really comes across. So uh, here's to your legacy in, in behalf of your mother's name. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.